1 John. I'm going to do just a little introduction tonight to the book of 1 John. I'm not going to preach a full message, and then we'll have our question and answer time afterwards. Um, uh, 1 John chapter 1, we'll look at several verses throughout the book, but it's a short book. Most of it's on one page. Um, at this point, I've preached through every New Testament book besides Luke, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And um, after we finished Colossians on Sunday morning, my plan, let me turn my microphone on here, my plan is to go right into the book of Luke, and my plan on Sunday nights is to work here through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They kind of go together. A confession to make, though, about 1st John. Um, there's a reason why. I've pushed this one off to last. Uh, it is, uh, in my opinion, one of the toughest epistles in the New Testament. It's one that's always made me kind of scratch my head. Um, when you read, for instance, one of Paul's letters, like uh, Romans or Colossians, very, very logical, okay? Um, but when you, when you get to the book of 1 John in particular, um, you... It seems like John is talking in circles, you know. Paul is very logical and very straightforward, um, but it seems like John in 1 John is sort of talking in circles. And I'll give you an example. Look at uh, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you've heard from the which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, in, in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. So he's like, I, I write no new commandment, and then in the next verse he's like, but I write a new commandment. It's like, what? Anybody ever read this book before and, and just like kind of scratch your head at some of this? Um, am I the only one? Uh, there are lots of parts of First John that are like this, where it seems like John is kind of going around in circles. And there are other things in the book of 1 John that give some people fits. Um, 1 John seems to be teaching uh, uh, a work salvation in parts. For instance, 1 John 1, 6 says this. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Um, if you look at chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Uh, probably the biggest one is chapter 3, verse 6. It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. I remember years ago uh, getting a pamphlet from a Pentecostal, like an old school Pentecostal church, like a little booklet uh, on the book of 1 John, and it was teaching that you had to be sinlessly perfect to stay saved. This is where they would go to teach those things, okay? And so this book of 1 John, if you don't understand it, can be a problematic book. Uh, when I was teaching a couple weeks ago in Africa, uh, one of the, some of the better questions that I got were people, I wasn't teaching on 1 John, they just decided to ask tough questions all the time, but uh, some people brought up 1 John and they said, what does this mean? What, what does this mean? Um, does this mean, you know, we can lose our salvation? And they were asking me these questions. There's a lot of problems here, okay? But I think the, the reason why 1 John is problematic is because it's often misunderstood, and the biggest source of that misunderstanding is not understanding who it was written to and what it was written for. And so I want to clear that up tonight and hopefully set the tone for the rest of this study as we go through the book of 1 John on Sunday nights. Um, this little bit, book was written by the Apostle John, the same John you know, that leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. It was the same John that got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and James. Um, John was probably the youngest of the apostles. And it, some people think he could have been a teenager even when he was walking with Jesus. But when he wrote 1 John, he's an old man. Very likely the last apostle that's still alive. The rest of them had all gone and died martyrs' deaths at this point. And John outlived them all by many, many years. 
And he was a pastor in Ephesus, up in Asia Minor. And he was a pastor there for a long time. And about the time John was getting ready to die, there was a new heresy that kind of swept through the churches uh, there in Asia Minor. And historically, we know who these guys were. We know about this heresy. There was a, a group of early Gnostics called the Serentianists. They were followers of this guy named Serentus. And he was a false teacher in Asia Minor. And Serentus and John were kind of like arch nemesis. They were, you know, they were, they were against each other. Um, there's this famous story where John was going to a bathhouse to have his bath. And he sees Serentis in there, and he grabs his clothes and runs out, and he says, we got to get out of here because Serentis is in here, and God might judge the place because the enemy of truth is taking a bath in here, and I don't want to be in here at the same time. All right? Um, so there's this guy, Serentis, he's popular, and he basically taught two things that we see combated again and again here in 1 John and throughout the scripture, really. The first thing he taught is that Jesus was not tr fully human and fully God. He actually taught that Jesus became Christ at his baptism. And that Christ, I don't know how this makes sense, Christ left Jesus, the God part of, of Christ left Jesus before he went to the cross, and Jesus, the man, died. Now, that's not found in the Bible anywhere. This is what this heretic was teaching. Okay? He denied the virgin birth of Christ. He denied the deity of Christ. He tried to mix the pagan Gnosticism that was popular at that time with uh, Christianity. And it was popular. Okay? The second thing this guy Serentis taught is that if you want to be saved, you have to be circumcised and you have to follow the rules of the Old Testament. Okay? And so what a lot of scholars think happened is that Serentis... Uh, and his followers gr gained ground there in the churches in Asia Minor, where John was, uh, where he was pastoring, and he convinced a lot of these people to go astray. He, he, he caused a lot of these people to go astray. There was a great church split, if you will, in the churches in Asia Minor, and a lot of people followed this false teacher, Serentis, and left the church. And so, people think, this book, 1 John, was written in the aftermath of that. You have this elder statesman, this elder apostle, this beloved pastor, and he's pastoring these people for a long time. He's well up in years, and he's writing to these Christians, and he's trying to console them because they've just gone through this battle. And in writing this, he's trying to do several things. First, he's trying to, to console them as a pastor. There's a lot of little children um, greetings here in 1 John. John had a pastoral love for these people, and you see it if you look for it all throughout this book. I think the second thing he was trying to do, he was trying to put a nail in the coffin of this false doctrine of Serendianism. Uh, there's all kinds of verses about that. If you look for it, you see it all over the book. But for instance, look at 1 John 2.22. It says, Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Okay? So there's no doubt, John is trying to, to, to kill this false doctrine. And I think the final thing John is trying to do is he's trying to give comfort and assurance to the people that stayed with the truth. He's trying to show them that, in fact, they are the real Christians, and these people they all thought were Christians were, in fact, not real Christians. That these people that have left them were not real Christians. They are the real Christians. And he's trying to, to uh, just help them through this, uh, this time where they've lost so many people. And so uh, he does that by pointing out uh, these fake Christians had three things wrong with them. Okay, They had a bad doctrine of Christ. Second, they, they didn't live righteous lives. And third, they didn't have a love for the brethren. And apparently all of these came out of this conflict. All these things showed themselves in this conflict. So three themes that run through this little book are, number one, true Christians have a true doctrine of Christ. Number two, true Christians have righteous morality. They live, in, they live righteous moral lives. And number three, true Christians love the brethren. Now, 
once you understand that purpose and you understand what John is trying to do with this book, uh, it makes a lot more sense when you read it. And you start to put together these things and it seems a lot less circular, a lot less contradictory when you understand this. All right. Now, with that in mind, I just want to look at the first four verses tonight, just this introduction here to the book. It says, that which, we, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. All right. Um, even in this short introduction... There's a lot going on. How many of you had to diagram sentences in high school? Anybody? All right. We did. I don't know if they still torture children like that, but we had to diagram sentences. And if you look at the first three verses, they're really one long run-on sentence with a lot of kind of introductory clauses at the beginning. And where is the verb? Does anybody know where the verb is? It's not until verse 3. Okay, the verb is declare we unto you. So what is John saying here? Okay, I'm going to give you a shorter sentence, and then we'll talk about it for a minute. All right? I think the point John is making in these first four verses is this. We proclaim Jesus for all he is. Because only around Jesus can you have true fellowship and joy. We proclaim Jesus for all he is because only around Jesus can you have true fellowship and and joy. So let's break that down in two parts, all right? First part is we proclaim Jesus for all he is. And that's what John is doing here in the first three verses. He is telling us who Jesus is. And he tells us four things in these first two verses about Jesus. The first is Jesus was God from the beginning. Jesus was God from the beginning. Look at verse one. He says, that which was from the beginning. Okay? Now he's not talking about the beginning of the church. He's not talking about the beginning of the church service. He's not talking about uh, anything, but he's talking about the beginning of time. In the beginning. Uh, this is a, a nod back to John chapter 1, verse 1, where John wrote this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Jesus was God from the beginning. Jesus didn't become God at his baptism, Jesus was always God. So the, the very first words of this book, John is taking aim and he is making a swipe at these false teachers. There's no, hi, this is John, the beloved old apostle, writing to the churches of Asia Minor. No, John doesn't have any time for that. The first thing, right out of the gate, he says, Jesus is God and he always was. He always was God. Um, so that's the first thing John tells us about Jesus. The second thing he tells us about Jesus is that Jesus was a historical figure. He says, um, that which we heard, that's what we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon. Okay? Jesus was a historical figure. Jesus isn't some made-up myth. Jesus wasn't somebody that John or others uh, in the church just made up. No, this is somebody that at the time John was writing, there were multiple people, because he's using plural pronouns here, there were multiple people that were living in this church and in this area that had firsthand experience that were witnesses of Jesus. There were people that saw Jesus with their own eyes. There were people that heard Jesus with their own ears. There were people that didn't just see him in passing, but they got to look upon him. They got to study Jesus. So he was, from the beginning, he was God. He was a real historical person. All right? And, and Jesus wasn't some life force. He wasn't some um, aeon or something that just, some kind of phantom. That, that's what the Gnostics would teach. No, he was a real historical figure um, with plenty of living witnesses. The third thing that he teaches here in these first couple verses about Jesus was that Jesus was a man. 
a real man, a human. Uh, he says, our hands have handled. Uh, again, Jesus wasn't some hocus-pocus spirit. Okay, uh, He wasn't a hologram. They touched him. Jesus had come in human flesh. And why did he come? Well, the end of the verse tells us he was the word of life. Jesus came to be the word, and Jesus came to give us life. Um, that life, that eternal life, it says, was manifested. It was shown to John and the church. It was something they experienced. They were experiencing eternal life. The, the, the eternal life was manifested to them. They were partakers of it. So again, I said, you can break this in, in a sentence, we proclaim Jesus for all he is. That's what John's doing here in these first couple verses. He is proclaiming Jesus. He's declaring Jesus unto these people. And he's saying, this is Jesus. This is the real Jesus. He really is God. He really was a person. He really was human. He really is the word of life. All right? We proclaim Jesus for all he is. The second part of that statement I gave you was this. Because only around Jesus can we have true fellowship and joy. If you look at verse 3 again, uh, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That's the proclaim Jesus for all he is part. But look at the second part. He says, that you may have fellowship with us. Um, if you look at, at verse 4, it adds joy to that. It says that your joy may be full. So what John is saying is that if you want to have true fellowship, if you want to have true joy, you have to know who Jesus really is. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. You have to experience fellowship with Jesus, experience fellowship with God the Father, the real Jesus, the real God, not the made-up Jesus that false teachers were pushing. Uh, imagine this church in Asia Minor. It's hurting. You know, maybe half their people or a third of their people or maybe more are gone and they're left in the aftermath. The, these people have followed after this cult and they're, they're second-guessing themselves and they're thinking, are we wrong here? Or did we do something wrong? How did all these people that we thought were believers, how did they all go astray? And so John says, listen, you didn't really have fellowship with those people because they were worshiping a made-up Jesus. They weren't worshiping the true Christ. The only way to truly have fellowship um, and the joy that comes with true fellowship is to have fellowship with the real Jesus Christ. And so John says, I'm telling you about it. Let's put it this way, all right? Let's say you have some good friends that are Mormons, maybe, maybe your neighbors, maybe co-workers. And I like Mormons. Do you guys like Mormons? Mormons are hard to not like. All right? they're, they're, they're wholesome people. They're moral people. They make good neighbors. Um, but can you have true fellowship in a biblical sense with a Mormon? No. Because they're not worshiping the same Jesus as you. All right? Uh, they've added all kinds of made-up mumbo-jumbo to Christ. They've changed salvation. Eventually, if you befriend them, you're going to have to have that conversation. And very likely, you'll lose a friend. But at the very least, you're not fellowshipping around the true Christ with these people. And maybe you have people that are you know, friends that... Uh, that go to other churches that we could call cults, go to other churches that don't worship the true Christ, and you can't have fellowship with those people. I mean, I'm not saying you can't ever have a meal with them or you can't have anything to do with them, but what I'm saying is you can't truly have fellowship with those people because you don't share the same Christ. Um, they worship a false Christ, and there's no joy in that. It's a false religion. And so John is saying, look, we're declaring to you the whole Jesus because only around Jesus can we have true fellowship and joy. That's what this book is all about. All right? It's going to help us understand the person and work of Jesus. It's going to help us understand 
how we can have assurance of our salvation, it's going to help us to understand if we have false assurance of our salvation. All right, it's not going to just, it's not, the purpose of the book of First John is not to give everybody assurance of their salvation. The purpose of the book of First John is to give the truly saved assurance of their salvation. All right, so you're going to find that here. It's going to help us understand not everybody that calls themselves a Christian is in fact a Christian, is in fact saved. It's an important book. There's a lot of important stuff in here. Um, and I hope that when we're done with it, we'll have a greater joy and a greater fellowship around Christ. All right? So that's just the introduction to this, this book tonight. Um, I wanted to give that to you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll carry on and go more into that uh, next week. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. I pray that you'll help us as we move into this next part of the service um, to, to be honored and glorified in all that we do. Help us to have fellowship one with another, true fellowship around who you are and uh, around what the Bible says. Lord, um, I pray that you'll uh, keep us from saying things we shouldn't say and uh, help, us to, uh, help us to do all that we do in the right spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, I don't know if the people in the nursery wanted to be a part of this. I don't know who's in the nursery today. Okay. Uh.